Morning physics fans, today we're going to look at a projectiles question from the APU April 2021 paper one question five. As you can see, here's the question. It's a fairly bog standard kind of setup really. This time AQ have decided to use it in the context of the game of rugby, but of course it could be anything. And really you can see that the initial velocity of the ball is going to be 20, the angle is going to be 40 degrees, and we've got these crossbars at three meters. So it says, figure nine shows the path of a ball that's kicked and just passes over the crossbar. Initial velocity is 20 at an angle of 40 degrees to the ground. And as always, consider air resistance to be negligible. That's a hard word to say. And the top of the crossbar is, as we said, three meters above horizontal. Your first task then is to show that the minimum speed of the ball is about 15 meters per second. And the way to do this is to consider breaking down its initial velocity into its two components, its Y component and its X component. So let's call that UY and UX. Now UX we can see is the adjacent to the hypotenuse, 20 being the hypotenuse, therefore UX is going to be equal to 20 cosine 40 and UY is going to be equal to 20 sine of 40. Now the thing is, we know that U x is constant it's not going to change however u y is going to rise and fall depending where it is in its path so when it's at the top here we do know that u y u y is going to be zero and so therefore we can say that its minimum speed is going to be at that top point when the y component is zero therefore minimum speed is simply going to be 20 cos 40 and when you work that out you get around about 15.3 degrees. In question 5.2 we are asked to show that the equation for t follows this pattern and as you can see it's a quadratic we've got a t squared we've got a t and a constant so when quadratic equations come up in the projectiles you think of s equals u t plus a half a t squared well when quadratics come up in terms of t that is so what values are we going to use well we know that it's just going over the crossbar and the crossbar is three meters high. So we'll let S equals three. And by doing that, S equals three, we have defined positive as being upwards. Well, we know our acceleration is therefore minus 9.8. We're not putting in units, I'm just putting in the numbers for now. And U, because we're only dealing in the up and down component, we want U Y, which is going to be 20 sine 40, which surprisingly works out as 12.9 so let's chuck that lot then into our quadratic equation and change the color because we can and we get that 3 equals u which is 12.9 t plus minus a half 9.8 which is 4.9 t squared i'm going to scrub out that plus so we don't get confused now it's just a question of rearranging so we'll bring the first term over to the left obviously that will become negative and we'll bring the second term over to the left and that will become positive so we're going to end up with 4.9 t squared take away 12.9 t plus 3 equals 0 and bingo that's what we were after part 3 is asking us basically to find the roots of this equation and then to comment on the two values so let's do that now i'm not going to spend ages doing the maths here for you but if you use the quadratic equation given above and if you fill in the numbers you will get something like the orangey ready thing that i've just put on the screen for you when you solve that you will get the following two roots t equals 0.2 5.8 and 2.37. Both of those are two significant figures and of course in seconds. So what do these two numbers mean? Well the actual time that our ball will have taken to cross over that crossbar is going to be 2.37 and the first value, the smaller value, is the time taken for the ball to reach the first point when it is the same height as the crossbar there because of course if you stop and think about it it's going to go through a height of three meters twice in its journey isn't it so this is the first time and that there's the second time 
In 5.4, we've been asked to see if a ball kicked with exactly the same conditions as in figure 9 there will get over the bar, the crossbar, if it's kicked from 38 metres. So let's go back to our initial kick conditions and see if we know, we'll work out what this distance is in the initial condition. We know, of course, that speed is distance over time. So if we want to find the distance that it's going to travel along the horizontal there, it's going to be speed times time. Well, the initial speed is just the component of you in the x direction, which doesn't change, of course, so it's the only speed. So that's going to be 20 cosine 40. And then we've got to multiply that by the time, which we calculated previously as 2.37. When you do that lot, you get 36.3 meters. Now, in our question, we've been told that it's going from 38. So that means that if we're starting it at slightly further away, kind of like just under two meters, it's going to peak earlier. It's going to follow exactly the same path. So it's going to go under the crossbar there. So the answer is a categorical no. So this is one of the AQA wonderful questions when you get a chance to discuss the physics. And uh, there's an awful lot going on in a graph like this. So let's just first of all notice that we have velocity, vertical velocity, on the y and time on the x. So the gradient of the graph is going to be equal to the acceleration in the vertical distance. So we know we're going to have to think about things like g and the weight, i.e. forces up and down. So if the gradient is acceleration, let's deal first with a dotted line, so with, without air resistance. Well, this is a constant gradient, which is kind of understandable because there's only one force acting here. And the value of this grade acceleration is going to be minus 9.8 meters per second squared. It's negative, of course, because, well, you can see the gradient's negative, which implies that upwards is the uh, positive direction. So that's going to be a constant value of 9.8. What about for the ball with air resistance? So with air resistance, well, as you might expect, this is a lot more complicated. And at first you can see for the first sort of section of the graph, you can see that the gradient is steeper. And here we can see that towards the end, the gradient is less. And we'll come back to the point in the middle because there's a lot of, lot of points you can make about this with this bit. So with air resistance, we can say uh, that the acceleration at first is greater than 9.8. I mean, negative 9.8, I suppose we should say, shouldn't we? Why is this? And this is because we have the air resistance is actually pushing downwards because the ball is going upwards and it's pushing downwards in the same direction as the weight. Therefore, there's more force downwards. So it's acceleration downwards is greater than 9.8 because the air resistance is in same direction as the weight. So after it crosses over the axis then, the ball has changed direction, it's now coming down, so the air resistance is upwards. So after crosses T axis, the air resistance is now in the opposite direction to G, or weight I suppose we should say. And so the acceleration is reduced. But what happens when it crosses the axis? Well, if you look real careful at the point where it crosses the axis, and maybe we'll put a, a line on to show this if I can do it, which I can. So we take the gradient at the point where it crosses the axis, and you should see that it's parallel to the dotted line, which is actually to be expected because at that point, we've got no air resistance because it's not moving. So as um, it crosses the T axis there, is no V and so no air resistance and so acceleration is equal for both balls. So there's about six points there <laughs> and obviously we've now got to talk about the area under the graph. The area under the graph is going to be velocity times time which is going to be equal to the distance traveled and since both balls start on the floor and end on the floor and we're looking at a vertical distance, this is zero for both of them. So zero for both balls, because we're looking at the 
Y component. Obviously it's not true in the X component. But looking at the Y components then, if the overall distance is zero, you should find that the areas for each graph above the time and below the time are equal. Area for each graph above and below X axis is equal. That doesn't mean that the area under the one with air resistance and the area under the one without air resistance is equal. I don't mean that. I mean that for the air resistance graph, above and below are equal. And the other thing we can say is that without air resistance, we so no air resistance, unsurprisingly, ball travels further before it reaches the top. And that's because it's got no opposing forces. Brilliant question, that last bit. Well, I hope that was useful. It's a hard question, aren't they all? These are A-level physics, after all. And I find a lot of my students that I tutor find this kind of question really tough. So I hope that was useful.